Good morning. Thank you for coming down. Um, fake news. This is a real thing, and it's having a ground-shifting impact on our world. It's changed elections. Um, this is obviously a negative in the world, and it's become headline news. Um, and if there's only one good thing that comes out of this whole discussion about fake news, it's that we're starting to appreciate that our media environment may be being manipulated in some way. But I think the amazing thing is that why has it taken us so long to appreciate this? We're all looking at, like, Facebook, the scape scapegoat, as though they're the only sort of bad actor in this scenario. But actually, news has been being manipulated for 100 years, possibly longer, possibly through all time. And I've been a student of this ever since I was a young wealth manager way back at, 20 years ago at Goldman Sachs. Um, when I was in a team of four running about two billion of private client assets, and I was desperate to make a good impression, and I'm going to give you a quick confessional. Um, I wanted to make my first impact on the portfolios that we ran, which was probably 150 of them. So I saw this stock I'd been actually analyzing for some time, and I saw it drop by 30% one day, and I thought, crikey, there's a bargain. I'm going to try and buy this. But I couldn't go and pitch it to my team. I had to go and get the recommendation of the analyst upstairs in the research department. Now, this was an education software business, and he said, look, Ed, I'll find out what's going on. I'll call you back. So he went off, and about an hour later, he came back to me and he said, I've talked to everyone in the supply network. I've talked to everybody I know. I think he even talked to people at the company. I'm not sure. Um, but he came back and said, there's nothing wrong with this stock. It's still a buy. So I went to the team. I pitched it. I said, it's on the Goldman Sachs buy list. Let's buy it. And reluctantly, my senior bought it across all the portfolios. We bought about 2 million quid's worth. The next day, it fell 30% more. Um, <laughs> Now, I was pretty beat up, and uh, at least he had the experience and resolve to say something's going wrong here. He sold it. And the next day, there was news that there were ir accounting irregularities at the company. So thank God we got out. Anyway, this set me off with this kind of, at the start of my career, with a kind of skepticism about everything that is recommended around us, everything in our media environment which is around us. And that really started me off on my kind of campaign, which drives my career today. So my name's Ed Pagecroft. I'm co-founder, CEO of Stockopedia.com, which is an online service that helps private investors beat the stock market. How many subscribers are here? Hands up if you're a subscriber. Wow, there's quite a lot of you. Oh, oh God, I nearly fell over. Um, anyway, we, 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 we now have about uh, 10,000 uh, uh, using the service. And um, one of the things that I, I, one of the reasons I set this up was because of another time I was in, involved in a fraudulent stock, which was back in 2008. And I had uh, I quadrupled my money in this stock, but it was now 40% of my portfolio. And uh, I remember thinking it was going to go up six times by Christmas. It was a biometrics company. It was a Chinese company. I'd met the CEO. I was enamored with it. And unfortunately, it was another fraud. And I thought, God, this is like, this is terrible. And... I then set out to try and figure out a different way to invest, to analyze what works in investing, and also analyze why we, collectively, as private investors, make so many big money mistakes. Because actually, underperformance as private investors is kind of rife. So what I want to talk about in this speech is, one, why underperformance as private investors is not unusual. And then I want to step back a bit and actually understand what factors really work in stock markets. What are the real factors that drive outperformance in stocks? I'm going to then talk a little bit about batting averages of eight different classes of shares and show how certain classes of shares have much higher batting averages. Um, and then I'm going to talk about, I'm going to analyze four different popular idea sources for companies, uh, for private investors, including broker recommendations, including press tips, including bulletin boards, and including investment conferences. <clears throat> and I am going to then show you some statistics on those. And then I'm going to try and help everybody understand how to fish in a higher probability or high, higher batting average area of the market. And then at the end, I'm going to, because you know, we like stock picks for some reason, we're programmed that way, I'm going to give some at the end of, this se end of the session. Um, OK, so how well do we really do the first part of this, the truth about private investor results? Now, in all of my research that I did after 2008, before I set up the site, 
I gathered a lot of academic research papers on, on private investor results. One of the biggest studies was a study of 78,000 US stock brokerage accounts. Must have been before GDPR. Um, and uh, anyway, they actually, on average, underperformed the market by 3.7% annually. And this kind of study has been replicated in Taiwan, Finland, the UK, all kinds of different markets around the world, and finds us that collectively, we as individual investors, have on average, and average is okay, are deceptive, so not all of us, but on average underperform the market by a certain amount. So collectively, there's something going wrong. And I don't know if any of you, how many of you were here two, two years ago when I was last here and saw my Manage the Monkey speech? Anyone? So actually, there's a lot of newbies here. There's a lot of people who didn't see that. I thought about doing it again. Maybe next time I'll do it again. It was a really fun session where I, we did live polling with the audience. But I was trying to, trying to show everybody how our minds are programmed so that we have flaws. We have almost bugs in the brain, which actually make us prone to suboptimal decision making on investments. And this is a, these are some of the traits that we have that have been analyzed by behavioral scientists for decades. We tend to buy what's visible. We tend to buy brands we know. We buy things in the news. We buy stocks that are local, on our local markets. We buy the best pitch. Beware, Dragon's Den. Um, we buy what everyone else is buying. We ignore contradictory facts. And we buy too much of a good thing. We buy too much of the things we like. Now, the academics have got fancy names for these, like familiarity bias, narrative fallacy, confirmation bias. But this is a really thing, and it's scientifically proven, that our brains have a tendency to make suboptimal decisions. And as one of the authors of one of these studies said, uh, Barbara and Odin, with some notable exceptions, the evidence indicates that individual investors are subpar invest, uh, investors. Now, what I want to focus on in this, in this session is the notable exceptions, because I think more of us should be those notable exceptions. Private investors have everything going for them. They actually, we're, we're far, we've got a far better opportunity than institutions to do better in the market consistently every year. Um, so let's look on. And the way that we can do this and put our bets in the right part of the market is by knowing our odds. Now, I like cricket, so the best analogy is batting averages. Okay? If you know cricket, you'll know some batsmen are much better than others. And you'd rather have Joe Root and Virat Kohli and Steve Smith when he's not banned, uh, batting for you. Um, and I think you can understand that if you've got a team full of people with good batting averages, you're going to do well. Well, the stock market kind of works in the same way, and you want your portfolio to be like a really good batting lineup. Um, so I'm going to explain how to get good batting average stocks in this whole section. I'm going to look at a timeline to, to, to frame this, starting back in 1920, and talking about some of the ways that practitioners and academics have analyzed what works in stock markets. And I'm going to do this through the lens of three ideas, good quality companies, good value companies, and strong momentum companies, companies that are on the trend up. Okay? Now, way back in 1920, there was a chap called Jesse Livermore. And Jesse was a, a bit of a plunger. He started off in the bucket shops or the spread betters. But eventually, a book was written, possibly by him, maybe ghostwritten, which is one of the best books on trading ever. It's called Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, and everyone should have it on their shelves. He used to tape read. So back then, they didn't have charts. They just had ticker tapes. And you look at the ticker tapes, and you look at all the quotes that came out. And when he saw a level that a company went through, and it went up, he would buy it. So he always bought breakout stocks, and he made a fortune. Sadly, he also lost it because his risk management wasn't very good, and he ended up going bust and committing suicide. So the idea of momentum, in <laughs> momentum investing didn't get off to a good start. Um, but shortly after that, and uh, the Great Depression happened, and Benjamin Graham was this very erudite uh, intellectual who um, is now known as the father of value investing. And he wrote this tome called Security Analysis, which is a terribly dry read. I've tried to read most of it. But in, in that book, he actually explained how you should buy companies at big discount to their assets. Because he, he was always obsessed with a margin of safety. So you buy stocks that are worth far less than you can actually sell them if you liquidate them. And you should be kind of safe. You should always get your money back. Now, he did this. And he pioneered deep value investing. And he did very, very well out of it after a bad time in the Great Depression and made, became worth a fortune. But he's also a teacher. And he taught that most famous of investors of all, Warren Buffett. And he taught Warren Buffett all everything he knew about investing. And Warren Buffett took it, 
But then he moved, Warren Buffett iterated on that idea of value investing and started appreciating the quality of a company, the quality of the franchise. And he merged quality investing with value investing to actually become one of the wealthiest men on the planet. Now, all of this went on from 1920s up to 1980s with practitioners working in these sort of areas of the market, people running funds on momentum, on value, on quality, and doing very well. But there was no evidence apart from anecdotal evidence that these ideas worked. Now, that all changed in about 1980 in the 80s as two things happened. One, computer power accelerated with Moore's law, and databases started being created, on which kept all of the company uh, fundamental and technical data and price histories. We have these enormous databases. And that enabled security analysis to become a science. And that's when the academics started working really, really hard to prove these ideas. Now, these two guys that I don't expect many of you have heard of, Farmer and French, proved that stock returns not only were impacted by the, the tide of the market, but also that, that, that value worked, that buying cheap stocks outperformed expensive stocks. And they won Nobel Prizes for this. And then just shortly afterwards, a couple of other academics proved that an even more powerful force in stock markets was momentum. And they used historical uh, data to prove that if you just bought shares that were going up, they kept, tended to keep going up more than the market. And then more recently, through the 2010s, there have been more academics, such as Robert Novi Marx, who have proven that, again, good companies, unsurprisingly, tend to outperform junk companies. Um, so that's a potted history of this idea that there are three big, powerful forces, quality, value, and momentum. Now, bear with me as I dig a little bit deeper into this idea. Um, I want to look, because what I've been doing is I've been taking computer power as part of my work to analyze the big data on companies in the market, starting in the UK and then global markets, to actually analyze them through this lens, quality, value, and momentum, and create scores for companies from zero to 100. And what we've got here is on the right, if you can imagine you were to line up all the companies in the world from junk on the left to good on the right. So a good share is a highly profitable one, making lots of cash flow, high margins, very liquid, not much debt. And on the left, you've got those which are the opposite. They consume capital. They want your money. They're very levered. They're just really um, not great businesses at the moment. And you can see the vertical axis is the percentage annualized return over the last five years of these types of companies split into 10 buckets. And you can see that the very best quality companies in the market have returned about 13 14% a year um, over the last five years compared to the opposite, which have returned practically negative the same amount. And it's almost in sequence. It's a pretty picture, right? Let's look at value. Same idea, but on the right, we've got cheap stocks. On the left, we've got expensive stocks. And you can see that cheap stocks tend to outperform expensive stocks. And cheap by, I'm talking about stocks that are cheap on their PE and their yield and a whole bunch of metrics that we bring together into one factor, the value rank. And uh, you can see the same trend. Not as powerful as quality, but pretty good. And then finally, momentum, which I think most investors are most scared of and they poo-hoo this idea, that you buy shares which are at highs or breaking out, trending upwards, and you keep buying them. It's like a buy high and sell higher kind of idea, which seems so contrary to value investing. It's been an even more powerful force in the market and on future stock returns. 20% annualized for the top 10% shares that are trending up the most. We actually also incorporate broker upgrades and uh, forecasts of their future profits into this momentum idea. But you can see this is a powerful, powerful, powerful force. So quality, value, and momentum. Now, I would like to just do a quick poll, OK, in the audience. Let's imagine you've got a stock scored or ranked for quality, value, and momentum, and it's looking great on all three of those dimensions, OK? Um, so I'd call that a good quality, cheap, and improving share. And then can you imagine the opposite? It's poor quality, it's poor value, and it's poor momentum. And I call this junk, expensive deteriorating junk, OK? Not a pretty label for a stock. Um, can I just ask, hands up, who would want to buy the stock on the left versus the stock on the right? Hands up. Go on, don't be shy, don't be shy. If you haven't got your hand up, OK, who wants to buy the other type of share? Yes, I thought there'd be one person. 
Last time there was one person. Okay. Okay, you're all very rational, apart from you, Jen. Maybe you should come on stage and explain. Because I've been classifying shares in the market for some time, and using these classifications over five years, we can track the performance of these two different profiles of shares. So companies with that profile, high quality, high value, high momentum, versus the opposite, you can see this massive differential in returns. Super stocks, they were labeled, actually, and I got this idea and label of super stocks from a chap called Robert Haugen in a very uh, wonderful book that's a little hard to read called The Inefficient Stock Market. He was a finance professor, and he said, and I read here, imagine stocks that are liquid, financially sound, low risk, momentum in the market, profitable in every dimension, and becoming more profitable in every way, yet they sell at dirt cheap prices. This is a dream profile, the profile of a stock you would love to own. We shall call this the profile of a super stock. So I got it from this, from a professor. Um, and the other one, the other profile he called dis disgustingly ugly. Um, and he called them stupid stocks. I prefer to call them sucker stocks, which is a bit, uh, a bit of a dangerous term, but it's kind of like, you know, you think you've only got to be pretty gullible to invest in these sorts of stocks. Anyway, you can see that one share does much better than the other. So you're obviously going to get better results if you invest in the, the kind of share that you all put your hands up for. But unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. It's not as easy as that. I want you to look at this slide and look at the shares that are in it. And I've cherry-picked a few shares to show that currently on my system, Tesla, great cars, really good cars, not sure if it's a good stock. Um, buy the cars, maybe not the stock, but that is currently in this category of, that we label sucker stocks, as well as purple bricks, which is a very popular share amongst private investors. Um, super stocks seem to be a little bit more dull and a little bit more kind of less interesting. And this is exactly what happens when you classify the market like this. Now, the thing is, um, we all have a tendency to prefer the profile of shares really on the right, psychologically, for some reason, because they're more exciting. But the thing is, if you look at the win rates, the hit rate, or the batting average, not at the, the kind of stocks that fall in the bucket on the left, you, you, if you throw darts at it any year, you would have a two to one ratio of picking a winner. Whereas on this side, you'd only have a one in three chance of picking a winner in any one year. And we've been analyzing that over a few years. And really, this is about the psychological profile of these kind of investments. It's difficult to buy quality stocks, or uh, sorry, cheap stocks, value stocks, often because they have problems or they're seen as risky. Um, people often don't like buying good stocks because they're seen as boring. And we as private investors tend to look at the quality of the products, not the quality of the business. So, you know, we've got to look, learn to look at the quality of the business. And often people don't like to look at improving stocks because they trade at new highs, which is scary. So it's kind of contrary to human nature. Now, um, if I look at the top here, we think of this winning style of share, this super stock with this QVM lens, and down the bottom, this opposite horrible profile of a share. You can also imagine, what if there are different combinations of these three quality value momentum factors? Imagine a stock has actually got two different sequence of two of these three factors, but not the other one. And, we can, and I'd like to create different labels for these types of shares. Turnarounds, high flyers, or contrarian shares. So a contrarian share is something that's really good and really, che really cheap, and, and also trading at a dip, kind of thing that Neil Woodford or Warren Buffett likes to buy. So these are all different classifications of shares. But there, there are also three different classifications of losing shares that I call Momentum traps, value traps, and falling stars. And if you come up to my stand, I've actually got, we've got lots of sort of, I've got some materials about this, and I'd be very happy to send anyone the presentation. But what you have is four kind of good profiles and four bad profiles. And if you look at the performance of these eight classifications of shares, you see this picture. The green lines are the four favorable classifications. The red lines are the four less favorable classifications, okay? So if you want to beat the market, you want to be in those green buying shares in those green classifications, okay? Are we all clear? We know what we want to be doing. Well, now that I've given you some sense of batting averages for these classifications, we'll move on. And I want you to remember this quote from that old chap, Ben Graham, because he said, in the short run, the stock market's a voting machine, but in the long run, it's a weighing machine. And this means that in the short run, stories tend to win, but in the long run, statistics win, okay? You can't get away from the fact that 
The statistics are proven to work over the long run. So how do you get stock ideas? And I have to admit, lots of these ways were how I used to get stock ideas, and now I don't, because I've learned a few things about markets. So I'm going to look at the base rates for common idea sources, and we're going to look at these four sources through this lens of these classifications. Now, I hope I haven't gone too quickly. I'm sure I'm under time pressure, but um, I think we've got the general gist. So we're going to look at broker recommendations, press tips of the year, bulletin boards, and investment conferences. Okay, and look at them as one by one. Now, first of all, I want you to understand that when I classify the market in these three er in those areas of winning styles on the left, the winning class of shares, and losing batting averages over there, there's also a third of the market that I classify as completely neutral because they don't fall into either of those camps very neatly. So when I'm going to show you each of these idea sources through this lens of a pie chart. We're going to start with broker recommendations. Now, remember, if a certain class of idea source was a really good source, we'd expect it to find, if it was going to do well in the market, we'd expect it to have a much bigger green segment of uh, this pie chart. So broker buy recommendations. You can see that actually they're, 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 they're telling you they're not actually adding much value. So you've got two-thirds of a chance of not buying a high batting average share from brokers, if, from broker buy recommendations. And this is the top 10% strongest buy recommendations from brokers. Okay? And if you look at the performance history of broker recommendations, I don't know if you can see these lines, but you can see that the buy recommendations barely do any better than the sell recommendations. The buy recommendations is the green line, the sell recommendations is the red line, and the yellow or orange uh, line is what they're telling you to hold. So as you can see, um, and all of these are underneath those green classifications, those higher batting average types of shares I'm talking about. So we're not getting much value from the brokers. Press share tips. I've taken the 38 tips of the year 2018 and looked at how they're classified. A slightly better pool of shares, but still less than a 50% chance of putting you in that positive batting average part of the market. Still a one in four chance that you'd be selecting a share with a very, very bad batting average and a ne negative expected return. And, I don't and the one thing you've got to realize is that what I find is that the press tend to pick the worst investments in that green part of the market. This is the Guardian tips of the year from last year. Um, and the average of their share tips underperformed by 8% that year, uh, minus 2.8% against the FTSE at 7.5%. And, you know, it's one of the problems. They all go and pitch what they see as an exciting share. And, of course, often, so regularly, you see these kind of dismal returns. And, in fact, one of the best investment magazines that is on the shelves of every news agent in Britain actually underperformed by 14% last year. Um, so this is a very prevalent thing. Bulletin boards. I love beating up bulletin boards. Um, this is the, th the, three, the top three most popular bulletin boards in the UK. Um, I'm not going to name them. But uh, more than 50% chance of finding a share when one of these kind of losing hit rate classifications. Only a one in four chance of finding a share with a better batting average um, than, than, than typical. And I haven't updated this chart for a few couple of years, but you can see that the, very, the most discussed shares on bulletin boards I've tracked as portfolios, and they tend to underperform the market. This is as we'd expect. Now, the next slide um, normally gets me into trouble. But I keep getting asked back, uh, so I'm going to keep doing it. Um, investment conferences. OK. <laughs> now, I've taken a pool of stocks at an investment conference not too far from where you are and put them through this lens. Um, and as you can see, there's a th only a 5% slither of what I would call high batting average shares. Now, listen, I want to make something really, really fundamentally clear. I'm a huge advocate of investing in small companies, in growth companies, in the possible giants of tomorrow. But I think one of the things that's really important for private investors is to understand that if you're building a portfolio, you want to have a thin slither of your portfolio in these kinds of shares. Okay? We all really should be investing in the future of the economy. And I think that's very important to understand. But I think you've got to understand that people are pitching, and they are collectively, as a group, likely to underperform the market. And I think you know, that's just the nature of statistics, as Ben Graham taught us. Now, I've actually got a company directory, which has got um, a, a page a bit like this on it, which shows you the rankings and the classifications 
of all the shares that are exhibiting. And do come and get one from the stand, because it will definitely help uh, give you some numbers on those stocks. Um, it's upstairs on the stand. I've only got a limited number, so uh, and I'm just giving them away. But please come and, do come and see. But I have been tracking the stocks as a portfolio for four years that actually do exhibit at investment conferences. And as you can see, it's been a pretty negative return profile. Um, I'm going to get my hand smacked for this, um, but I feel like I should always be on the side of the investors and actually give you absolute clarity on what's in front of you. Um, so the FTSE All Shares in grey and the expected sort of the return that's actually happened is there. And I think I, I understand, you know, you should understand how this works. Now, a little thought experiment. Imagine that every stock in the market is a dot on this scatter plot, okay? And those green winning classifications of shares that have a good batting average and a positive expected return are at the top there. And the losing classifications are down there. And you've got a whole set of sort of nondescript, unclassified shares in the middle, a third, a third, a third. And we're going to look at these four idea sources, picking out the dots in the stock market. There are 1,500 dots on this slide. Um, but of the broker recommendations, this is the top 100 strong buys. And you can see it's a scatter plot that's no better than random, right? If you look at press tips of the year, they've selected 38 shares in the Independent, Guardian, Times, Telegraph, and the Mail, which were the tips of the year. And again, it's a scatter that's pretty random, okay? You're going to look at bulletin boards, and it's a bit more shifted down to the bottom here. These are the most discussed shares at the moment on three of the most popular bulletin boards. And bulletin boards are just like ideas from your friends, generally, I think. Um, and then investment conference is a bit lower. <laughs> and let's put it all together. Bang. And I see this as the kind of available universe for private investors. This is the media environment for private investors to pick shares from. If you only pick shares from those four idea sources, you might understand why you might not be getting better than average returns. I mean, at the best, you might hope. If you're really lucky, you might do OK. But on average, you're not going to do so well. And the thing is, this is what I try and evangelize, is that you should only be looking up there, only as a pool with a high batting average, because then you can actually do better in the markets. And you know, I've been obsessing about this since about 2008, and only investing in these areas. And I can tell you it works incredibly well. And I'm going to explain to you now before I do, this wonderful quote from Sir John Templeton, if you want to have better performance in the crowd, you must do things differently to the crowd. And that, that's really important because it's our retirements, and we're saving for weddings or whatever, our children or whatever it might be, holidays. And, you know, we've really got to get better outcomes. And otherwise, we might as well just all buy index trackers, you know? And I just think that's a really, really poor idea. Um, so how do you do that? How do you find higher probability shares? And... I want to have another poll, okay? Quick poll, quick hands up, always quite fun. Um, sorry? Okay, I, I nearly finished. So um, everybody, if uh, you, uh, can you put a hands up? Who uses a set of criteria in the uh, market? Hands up if you use a strict set of rules, more than last time, okay? And as Jim Slater said to me, and his son's speaking later this afternoon, it's all about the criteria. You must have a set of criteria. And you've got to construct criteria in an only, the, the only process that works. And this is understanding what pays off and why, building a checklist or a score based on those factors, buying stocks that fit the checklist, selling stocks that don't fit the checklist, repeating it, and then not getting distracted. Okay? And it's very hard for investors to do this, because often they don't know how to create a checklist. And they often don't use it. I would say that was 10% of you using a, a checklist, which puts you at your whims, puts you at the mercy of the environment. Here's a very simple example checklist, OK? Quality, value, momentum. Six rules that will keep people out of trouble, OK? Firstly, return on capital, more than 12%. OK, that's the kind of thing that would be a pool of stocks that Warren Buffett would invest in, that Nigel Ray would invest in. OK, great investors always have that metric on their slide. Lower gearing, lower debt, debt to equity less than 50%. Buying things that are reasonably priced, P ratio less than 15. Buying dividend yields that are higher than the average in the market. And then on momentum, buying shares at new highs or who are having their broker numbers upgraded. Very important to know. 
Okay, now what do you find? If you apply six of these rules, you only find four stocks in the market. So the thing you've got to do is realize you want a checklist and not every stock you look at will actually qualify for every single one. Okay, now I've found if you find four or five or six of these things are, are correct for every, every share, you're minimizing the number of low batting average shares that come into your pool. Now there are three ways of putting checklists to work. I was given 40 minutes, you ran over. I think the audience would like to hear me finish. No, I'm not. Thank you, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so number one, put checklists to work. I'll rattle through as quickly as I can. Number one, reading accounts. You can read accounts and make spreadsheets. Now the cost you pay with that is you need to know how to do it and it takes time and it takes effort, okay? And that's a fine cost to pay, and a lot of great investors I know do that. Another way is to use free data on the web. And the problem with that is you need a gas mask, because free data, if you're not paying for it, they don't care about it. The other thing to do is to use a premium data service, okay? And you pay money for that, okay? And that's, I do run something like that, but I prefer doing it that way, because it makes things more simple for me. And if you, you, there's another way of doing it, rather than checking on a case-by-case-by-case -by -case -by -case basis, and that's applying checklists as a screen. So you build a set of rules and use a database, and you whittle down this big universe, 2,000 stocks, down to uh, a much more narrow universe of shares. And you can apply rules based on quality, value, momentum sequentially on the market. And that's something I do, and I actually do uh, about, have run about 60 different strategies in the market, such as Jim Slater's strategy, using this lens to uh, bring down uh, shares to a very, very small uh, set of stocks. Now look, Jim Slater's Zulu principle that I tracked for seven years, 22% annualized in the market, an amazing return. Lots of people on our service actually use this kind of strategy and, and 60 others like it to try and get better returns. Personally, I run my own strategy using my own metrics, proprietary metrics, which simplifies this idea with a score for quality, a score for value, a score for momentum. And I call it the NAPS portfolio. And it's done about 115% over the last three years, 29% annualized. So I think you can see there's some merit in these ideas. Now, before I get thrown off, I'm going to give you five stop picks, okay? But remember these ideas, quality, value, momentum, and I'm going to give you five stock selections. So the last time I was on this stage, I'm on my last two slides, and I'm eight, quick, eight minutes quicker than my last rehearsal. Um, so the last time I was here was 2016, where I showed the same sort of slides and Tom didn't get upset, so I thought it was okay. Um, 2016 picks in review, and I picked these completely systematically just from criteria to find high batting average shares. Now, the outcome was okay, Tw an average gain of 20% in that period, three returned 45% or more, one unfortunately uh, declined 28%, and one declined 9%, but an average return of 19%. Now, I never ever advocate buying five shares in these ways. I always suggest a diversified portfolio of about 20 stocks. It's much, much less risky. And here is the selections that fall out of the process this year. Five stocks that, I, of course, nobody will want to buy because, you know, they're not Tesla. Um, Griffin Mining, SCS, Communisys, Plus 500, and Computer Center. And... They're all in five different sectors, and, uh, and that's really it. If you want to learn anything more, you can come and talk to me, and I have a seminar at 2.20 upstairs, fittingly, in the Slater room, and I hope to see you there. I'm going to get my hands wrapped now. Okay. No worries.